So welcome back to our Christmas series here from the Bruderhof. We're going to be talking more about our various Christmas traditions mm -hmm. today. And we really should have cups of cocoa in no, our hands. I was hoping someone would bring some cookies or something. Oh, well. Well, think about them. Imagine them. Yes. Right here. Uh, the first tradition we want to talk about is 100 days until Christmas celebration. Now, I'm not sure when this tradition originated or started. We've been celebrating it as long as I can remember. Likewise. Yeah. But it's something that we really look forward to and it happens 100 days prior to Christmas. September 16th. Yes. Which is the birthday of my daughter. Oh, really? Yeah. That's very exciting. Special. And you're really not usually feeling in a very festive mood on that day. I mean, it's usually beautiful September weather. So this tradition is just a gathering with the community and it involves glue vine, mulled wine for the mm -hmm. adults, as well as really delicious Christmas stalin, which mm. is basically an enriched bread with nuts and raisins and rum. Right. And um, I should mention that Another thing that's maybe not so Christmassy about Stalin is actually in the Bruderhof, there's, very, there's uh, Stalin factions. <laughs> yeah, we, should, we, we should discuss, discuss the that. Stalin. Yeah. So I think there's a yeast Stalin and then there's like a, a baking, yes, a baking and, powder Stalin. Mm -hmm. And people feel very strongly. I personally love all Stalin. So you don't discriminate? I don't. I mean, I, it's hard, to, hard for me to tell the difference, but... Anyway, the, the, the baking powder stone, I believe, is a little bit heavier and yes. a bit more traditional, and the yeast stone is more like a Christmas bread. So each has their place in my mind, but there's definitely, um, there's definitely uh, factions and, and you know, pride yeah. in family recipes. So. And I think that's because we do have uh, just a wealth of really good bakers mm -hmm. and, and, like Rich was saying, people that pride themselves in those like cultural narratives and traditions mm -hmm. from different parts of Germany or other European countries. So I think it's, it's quite comical how, <laughs> how excited people can get about it, but it's usually all in good fun. No, it's all in good fun. <laughs> yeah, 100 days to Christmas, it, it's, it, it's in and out, you know, one day mm -hmm. uh, to sing some Christmas songs and um, realize that uh, Christmas is coming and Christmas is the answer to many of our uh, problems and fears and worries. The, the fact that Jesus is coming and actually can come at any point during the year. And for me, it's always a great moment to pause and think about that message and kind of recenter or refocus on the gospel. Mm. The next one we want to talk about is the Santa Lucia tradition, which takes place on December 13th. 13th. Yes. And Doreen should probably talk about it because she probably has more direct experience with it than I do. So Santa Lucia is a Swedish tradition that was introduced to our community through a member who joined in the 50s, Ruby Moody, whose mother preserved the Swedish tradition for her as a child. Ruby taught the 7th and 8th grades in the elementary school, so that's really where the tradition took off. And when I was in 7th grade, I recall um, Ruby's granddaughter, Emily, was my teacher, so she really took the time to explain the tradition. And we started the day prior prepping Santa Lucia buns, as we called them. Mm -hmm. It was also another really delicious and rich dough that we would make. And that was an experience in, it, in and of itself because you had to figure out the math and the quantities to make enough for all the students' families, and most of us had rather large families. You can imagine this group of students traversing through the community, going to uh, visit their families uh, in the early morning hours, and then going into the parental bedroom mm -hmm. with this wreath of burning uh, candles and some cups of coffee, which often by the time they got to the parents were kind of lukewarm. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there was, uh, there's plenty of stories of fire alarms mm -hmm. and um, scorched hair. Yes, one of, the, one of the years that I did, was able to do that, we went into a building and the family there had hung um, paper chains down the hallway. And 
Our Santa Lucia was no joke. She was a fairly tall lady and she caught the paper chains on fire. So needless to say, it was a very exciting morning. Next up, uh, another thing that we really look forward to every year is practicing um, one of the great Christmas choral works. So that would be like Handel's uh, Messiah, selections from Handel's Messiah, um, J.S. Bach's Christmas Oratorio, um, The Star of Bethlehem, which is a beautiful piece uh, by Joseph Reinberger, and uh, Oratorio de Noel by Camille Saint-Saëns. Saint-Saëns. Yeah. Saint-Saëns. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece. And, um, you know, none of us are probably that talented, um, either musicians or singers, but it's just a lot of fun and also meaningful to get together as a community, you know, divide up into, into singing parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and practice these pieces. And they really become part of you in a way that um, doesn't happen if you just listen to them. What's your favorite? My favorite is Handel's Messiah, mm. for sure. But all the other choral works that you mentioned are fabulous and very uplifting. And I recall as a child going to choir practices, as we would call them, and I was assigned um, uh, another sister who was in the soprano section was my choir buddy. And I just remember thinking she had the voice of an angel and learning all the notes from her and that, that doesn't leave you. Yeah. And it's a great experience also to get to know other people in the community in that capacity and, yeah. and learn those pieces by heart. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a different form of worship. Yeah, yeah, it is. And then the, the, the actual performance, the culmination of it, there's usually about 10 people in the audience, <laughs> people who can't or won't sing. Right. And um, they you get to listen to the you know, other 250 of us yeah. uh, blasting away. Do you play an instrument? I uh, actually played piano and was terrible. Yeah. I, had, I had to give it up. How about you? Likewise, my piano teacher told me that I was a failure. Yeah. So. <laughs> but that's another great thing is, is for the kids who are talented um, yeah. at playing violin, cello, whatever. That's a great experience for them to work, you know, play in the community choir. So. Yes. Something that's very meaningful to me every Christmas, and I think this, this stems from Christmases with my grandparents mm. who were of German heritage, um, was singing these really ancient and traditional Christmas carols. I believe they're probably Germanic Latin yeah. traditionally, yeah. but they're often quite long with many verses. And I remember memorizing them as a child. And then on very special occasions, we would sing these songs. I think part of that is also these beautiful songs about Mary. We yeah. call them Marian leader. Mm -hmm. You know, people sometimes think because we're Anabaptist um, and not Catholic uh, that we, you know, don't think much about uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. But that's, that's not true because uh, for us, you know, Mary, we have a lot of reverence and respect for Mary. She's the only woman to receive Christ through the Holy Spirit. So it is important for us to honor her, um, especially in words and song, and that's not to be confused with uh, worship. Another song which has strong associations to Christmas and the Christmas story for me is a one we have in our songbook. It's called Who's Knocking There? Mm. And I remember singing this every year. Sometimes it's even enacted in a communal gathering or celebration, but the song really powerfully portrays how Mary and Joseph was rejected. Um, everywhere they tried to find lodging and shelter, the inn was full. So what happens in the song is the, the men sing the innkeeper's part and the women sing the part of Mary and Joseph mm. begging for lodging and shelter and then getting rejected and then the lesson from that after they find the stable and the Christ child is born. So I remember hearing this as a kid and just weeping because it's mm. very impactful yeah. um, and that's never going to leave me and it's something I hope that we also continue to sing and yeah. pass on to the children. Well, that's a reminder that for each of us, keep our doors open and, uh, you know, uh, hospitality and welcoming the stranger is just such a fundamental mm -hmm. um, part of following Jesus and and that's what we're called to um, in our life together. So, well, thank you for watching and listening to us meander. <laughs>
but we do wish you a Merry Christmas. If there are Christmas traditions um, that you that are important to you, uh, please let us know about them in the in the comment section, because uh, you know people celebrate Christmas in many different ways, and it's fun to learn what others do, and, and maybe. You, uh, you can incorporate some of our traditions into your lives and, and maybe, you know, if you let us know about yours, maybe we can incorporate them uh, into our uh, Christmas celebration. So, thank you for watching and we wish you joy this season and see you next time. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.